Well, welcome to episode 361 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. And this time I'm going to talk about this release from 1958 on Emerson Records, Rolf Erickson and his American Stars. This record has a somewhat eccentric release history. There are only three official releases. The first was for a British label called Nixa in 1957. The recordings are made actually in 1956. This is the only American release. It was originally recorded by the Swedish label Metronome, but strangely, it never had a domestic release in Sweden. It was eventually released on the Metronome label, but only in Japan under the name Flight to Jordan, capitalizing on the name recognition of the pianist Duke Jordan, or as the back cover says, Fright to Jordan. It's an easy record for people to pass up. Why? Well, the guy on the cover is a Swedish guy. He's got a pencil mustache like a sergeant major, and he's not exactly a big name in jazz. He's a little bit niche, I guess you'd say. But don't be deceived. Not only are all four of his sidemen on here, basically straight from the best clubs and the best record labels in New York City, Erickson himself has spent seven of the previous nine years apprenticing on 52nd Street and in Greenwich Village, and consequently, this is American hard bop from the mid-1950s of very high quality. In telling the story of this record, I'm relying at points on a great source regarding the emergence of Swedish modern jazz in general, written by an American archivist, a guy called David Tennenholtz, when he was a grad student at Rutgers. It's called Out of Nowhere, The Rise of the Swedish National Jazz Tradition, 1945 to 1976, and I put the link to that paper in the description below. Before discussing Rolf Erikson, it's probably a good idea to contextualize this record in light of the jazz scene in Sweden in the years after World War II. Sweden had had a jazz scene before the war. Unsurprisingly, it basically reflected the major themes of American jazz, so sweet jazz, hot jazz, the big swing bands. Since the mid-1920s, there had been a legitimate domestic jazz scene, and in the 1930s, a lot of big American acts had come through Stockholm. But the intervention of the war, combined with a recording ban in the United States between 1942 and 1944, meant that modern jazz records and the whole modern jazz ethos was pretty slow to arrive in Sweden, not until 1947 or 48, did American musicians begin to return to Sweden in numbers and American records start to get through again. In 1947, Tyree Glenn, who was an American trombonist, played Stockholm, and he ends up making a recording with a clarinet player there, a Swedish guy called Aka Hasselgard. Glenn is impressed with Hasselgard's playing, and he encourages him to move to the jazz scene in New York, which Hasselgard does very shortly thereafter. He arrives in New York in the late summer of 1947, and he's the first Swede to get anything like significant exposure on the thriving bebop scene as it was in the day on 52nd Street. He changed his name from Akia to Stan to increase his chances of getting booked by the club owners, and he ends up really making quite an impact. He plays with Benny Goodman, he records with Benny Goodman, he ends up leading his own group with Max Roach on drums, all in the space of about a year. But sadly, this great career, budding career, is cut short that fall, fall of 1948, when he's killed in a car accident. Sad as that story is, his example, however, had inspired another Stockholm musician, the trumpeter Rolf Erikson. Erickson was 25 years old in 1947, and having seen Hasselgaard head up to New York, very soon he follows suit that same fall. Initially, he ends up staying in America for three years. He also played with Benny Goodman, he plays with Benny Carter, he headed out west, he played with Wardell Gray, played with Sonny Chris, and he also played for a time in some bigger orchestras led by Billy Eckstein and Charlie Barnett. He didn't really enjoy his first sojourn in the States, however. He goes back to Sweden in 1950, and he gives an account to the press, which is a very unflattering portrait of life on the U.S. jazz scene, hard work, low pay, lots of drug use, it's very stressful, like there was a clique he couldn't get into and so on. And actually this interview is then reprinted in the November 30th, 1951 issue of Downbeat. Interestingly, in that same issue of Downbeat, Leonard Feather profiles a whole bunch of up-and-coming Swedish jazz musicians like Lars Hulin and Arna Domnerus, all of whom were inspired one way or another by Hasselgaard and Ericsson. And despite the fact that this was a point that Erickson had chosen to come home with his tail between his legs, the 1950s and 1960s see a whole bunch of jazz interchange between Sweden and the U.S. There's lots of examples of this. Charlie Parker tours Sweden in the early 1950s with Erickson and Domnerus and his band. Miles and Coltrane famously toured Scandinavia as their musical relationship was unraveling. And Sweden also plays a somewhat accidental role in the rise of prestige records. The sax player James Moody was in Europe between 1948 and 1951, and he plays Stockholm. And while he's in Stockholm in 1949, he ends up cutting a whole bunch of tracks, one of which is I'm in the Mood for Love, sometimes known as Moody's Mood for Love, which is then licensed by Metronome Studios, the Swedish label, to Prestige. It becomes a huge hit for Prestige, and it puts Bob Weinstock of Prestige Records in a much more comfortable position where he can take on lots of other artists and take more risks. 
To come back to Rolf Erikson, as I mentioned, he'd come back to Sweden in 1950, kind of out of sorts, feeling he hadn't really been able to break into the big time in the States. Soon enough, however, he gets over his hurt feelings and he returns to America in 1952. He ends up recording with people as vaunted as Miles Davis and Duke Ellington and Charles Mingus. He goes out west. He records with the Lighthouse All-Stars. He is in the final lineup of the Curtis Counts Group. And for 12 of the 14 years between 1952 and 1966, he establishes a very creditable jazz career in the States. The story of this record, however, does not take place in the States, but in Sweden in the summer of 1956, when Ericsson returns on a tour with a band full of top-ranked American musicians. At this time, there was a Swedish promoter living in New York by the name of Klaus Dahlgren. Dahlgren had been a jazz musician and a jazz journalist in Sweden. He'd moved to New York in 1949, and Swedish radio had then put him on a retainer to find new hot jazz records to send back to Sweden, and also to do capsule reporting of what the jazz scene was like in New York. Great gig. And it was Dahlgren who organized Ericsson's 1956 Swedish homecoming tour. The plan was to do a tour of the so-called Folk Park music festivals in Sweden, which were a series of summer festivals. Dahlgren and Ericsson recruited some top-level talent for the tour. They included the drummer Art Taylor, who was at this point a sought-after drummer, having risen to prominence playing for people like Lou Donaldson, George Wellington, Bud Powell, and Art Farmer. The group also included the piano player Duke Jordan, who had played with Miles Davis in Charlie Parker's 1947-1948 quintet and is on those great dial records that Charlie Parker cut. The other group members included the tenor man Cecil Payne, who played with Dizzy Gillespie, J.J. Johnson, Kenny Dorham, and Tad Dameron, and the big band bassist John Simmons. One further musician, Ernestine Anderson, was also on the tour, and she sang with the group, although she does not sing on this record. They cut this record in Stockholm soon after they arrived, which was just as well, because things on the tour very quickly went sideways. And in particular, some members of the group had brought their heroin habits with them. And there was a bust by the Swedish police early in the tour, which led to all four of those sidemen being sent home. This is where it's all a little bit murky. It's not clear if Simmons and Payne and Jordan and Taylor were all implicated, but they all returned to New York. The detail as to whether all of them were deported on drug charges or if some of them left in sympathy, or if, as seems more than possible, some of them were just typecast for being black American musicians, all of that seems to have been lost in the historical record. But the bottom line was they went home. In their place, Dahlgren arranges for Freddie Red, Tommy Potter, Joe Harris, and Lars Hulin as substitutes. Ernestine Anderson did not go back to the States, and she ends up over the rest of the tour becoming quite a celebrity in Sweden. The recordings that make up this record occurred within the space of six days using the original lineup of the tour in the late spring of 1956 at Metronome Studios in Stockholm. There are four originals on the record, all of which were written by Duke Jordan, a couple co-written with Cecil Payne. On the 30th, they recorded Forecast and Vacker Flicka. On June 1st, Visby Groove Alley. And the last three tracks, Flight to Jordan, The Medley of Standards, and This Time the Dream's on Me, were recorded on June 4th. Side one begins with forecast, and whatever you were expecting when you put this record in the turntable, it's clear that Ericsson is a surprise package. All the others are relatively known quantities. He might not be Lee Morgan, but he is still a very credible, top-line, hard-bop trumpeter. He had totally assimilated the New York sound, as you might hear at Birdland, and this swings as hard as any late 50s Blue Note or Prestige session. Next is Vakar Flicka, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing. It's Swedish for beautiful girl. It's a sultry mid-tempo number, I guess appropriately enough, and it's driven by Simmons' excellent walking bass line. The last track on side one is Visby Groove Alley. This is a so-called intermission theme, much expanded upon. A lot of groups at the time would have a little number they would play when they were going to break. You can hear similar on Art Blakey or Shelley Mann's live records. Anyway, this is another great track. Side two begins with Flight to Jordan, which is probably the best melody line of the four Jordan originals on here, and probably also the best Cecil Payne tenor solo. We next have a lovely, chilled out medley of three tracks. I cover the waterfront, Laura, and everything happens to me. The treatment of waterfront by Pearson is fantastic. Payne takes a lead on Laura, and then Erickson plays the final solo. This is a really lovely track. And the final track on the record is an old Mercer Arlen standard, this time The Dreams on Me, which probably has Erickson's best work on the record. This record, for whatever reason, is routinely available on the used market, often at a bargain price. It's released by Emerson, which should be a clue as to the quality. I mean, this is a label at the same time bringing you Clifford Brown, the Brown Roach Quintet, Sarah Vaughan, and it doesn't feel out of place in the company of those records. I recommend it highly. Don't sleep on it if you see it. And for me, it's four and a half out of five stars. <laughs>